An international tribunal in The Hague has ruled overwhelmingly against China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. Beijing not only rejects this ruling, it even refused to participate in this case. To Crosstalk the South China Sea, I'm joined by my guest Wang Guan in Washington. He is the chief political correspondent at CCTV America. And in New York, across to Daniel Wagner, he is the CEO of Country Risk Solutions. Wang, if I can go to you first here, the issues of jurisdiction, participation, enforcement uh, are all called in question by many people here. Well, Peter, if we forget about Western mainstream press for a moment and look at UNCLOS chapter for chapter, we can see that this case in its essence, is about a court that ruled on something that he has not jurisdiction to rule on based on a geopoliticized lawsuit filed by the Philippines against China. And explain exactly what I mean. Uh, in Part 15, Section 3, in Article 298 of UNCLOS, it says the court cannot rule on jurisdiction, do not have the jurisdiction to rule on sovereignty. And did the court in the Hague rule on sovereignty? Well, uh, in letter, it did not. But in spirit, it did. Let's look at it. Uh, it ruled on 9 dash line. A claim by Beijing that it has some specific controls of the islands and the associated territorial waters. When you delegitimize that line, you delegitimize the sovereignty. So it is about sovereignty. And also it ruled on things like the land features, like the rocks or islands. Well, uh, despite the fact that in Taiping Island, Yunxing Island, uh, we have restaurants, banks, even internet Wi-Fi and uh, cell phone LTE signals, the court ruled that they are not islands, so they cannot confer 12 nautical mile territorial water. It is a territory. And eventually, uh, also, it ruled that China's land reclamation is illegal. Uh, it has something to do with territory and sovereignty. So the court, uh, in a nutshell, ruled, in, ruled about sovereignty in disguise of ruling on other things, which violated the uh, spirit, if not the text, of UNCLOS. And also, if I may add, Article 295 of UNCLOS uh, said the parties to the dispute should exhaust local remedies, meaning bilateral negotiations, right, right. before a party goes to the court. And the Philippines did not do that. Well, we could talk about wordsmithing all we want. At the end of the day, what's happening is China is claiming sovereignty over an enormous swath of the South China Sea, and no one but China agrees with it. Um, it would be a little bit like any other country saying, well, you know, I just like those, those uh, bits of water in those islands and I think I'll claim them for myself. In terms of seeking local remedies, well, many of the countries that are also party to this issue have sought local remedy with China. China hasn't been very forthcoming in that regard. And uh, I think it's, it's really a testament to the power of international law that a small country like the Philippines can take on a Goliath like China in this manner and prevail. Now, the court ruled the way that it did, not because it's David against Goliath. The court ruled because it took a very close look at the issues, and it said this is unreasonable and it does not stand. And no one be besides well, China agrees. In fact, no Western countries uh, supported China's point of view. There are dozens of countries that supported China uh, across the Middle East, Africa, in Eastern Europe. Well, those countries that support China because they're not sold with the Western narrative of this issue. Western narratives of this issue is very interesting in that they frame the issue very simplistically as if uh, the Philippines won China nil and China is not willing to abide by international laws. But I'm not sure how many Western editors and reporters um, read UNCLOS chapter for chapter, word for word. Uh, and then if they did, they would question the premise of their argument, that is, whether or not the arbitration court, PCA, has the jurisdiction to rule, to indirectly rule on sovereignty in the first place. And also, uh, I'm not sure how many um, Western reporters and editors uh, really talked to the legal scholars or quoted them from the other side. Uh, those scholars would point out that many legal principles actually supported Beijing's point of view, such as a stubble, meaning if a country like Vietnam did in the 70s once recognized recognize China's claims, as their Prime Minister Fan Men Tong did, uh, they're not supposed to recant withdraw their argument decades later. Uh, we don't see that in the Western press. And also, the Western press uh, framed the issue uh, as uh, without context, you know, as if China started dumping sand and uh, gravels in the middle of the ocean out of nowhere. Uh, they forgot the simple fact that their own president, Franklin Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower, once uh, sent naval vessels to help China claim, reclaim those islands after World War II, and once tacitly recognized China's claims. And we don't see any of that. So, yes, Western press are relatively free, but free press have biases. 
I mean, um, they yes, they attribute uh, each and every one of their sources, but who are their sources? How many non-Western sources do they take seriously? And yes, they attribute each and every one of their adjectives, but how about the carefully crafted nouns, such as communist China yeah, or yeah. legally binding arbitration? Those nouns that really reinforce and feeds into the stereotypes of okay. the Western audience. Daniel, it looked like you wanted to jump in in New York. Go ahead. Yeah, I would like to ask Wang to respond to a couple of issues. Uh, one is, uh, there are a number of instances where China has uh, basically joined a legal regime, Jung Close being one of them, and it's signed on the very day in 1982 when it became a legal instrument. And yet there have been numerous instances where China has said, you know, I don't actually like that portion of the law, or I don't like that ruling, so I'm not going to abide by it. So I would ask, what is the point of signing on to the law if you don't intend to abide by it when it doesn't happen to go the way you want it to go? Um, that's one issue. Second issue well, is Daniel, on well, Daniel, uh, the there's, very there's such a thing basic as reservations to a treaty. Ex exclusive economic zones. Let, let me just finish my point. Go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. So, so yeah, but you're not even showing up. But you're, you're, but you're not even showing up at this party. You're not, you're, not, you're not even party to this particular issue in the court. Um, the, the, the other issue is uh, exclusive economic zones, right? So that's supposed to go out 200 nautical miles. The Scarborough Show, the Mischief Reef, they're, you know, 120 miles from the Philippine coast. The closest of any of these islands in the South China Sea to China is almost 300 miles, the Paracel Islands from, from, from uh, Hainan Island in the south. So. None of these are within China's exclusive economic zone, yet Mischief Reef and the, and the Scarborough Shoal are clearly in Philippines' exclusive economic zone. And China does, it doesn't seem to matter to China. But okay. if this was done to China and the roles were reversed, I can imagine they wouldn't be okay, let's, let, let's let Wang respond to that. Go ahead, Wang in Washington. Go ahead. Well, Daniel, I don't, if uh, geographical proximity is the rule, uh, think about Northern Mariana Islands or Guam that is a little closer to, you know, countries in the Western Pacific than to continental United States. And also, when you raise the point of uh, why China do not uh, attend this arbitration, is because there's such a thing in international law called reservations. Uh, there are all reservations to treaties. China, along with some 30 other Western countries, Denmark, uh, Argentina, the UK, uh, signed this reservation saying that it does not allow the court to rule on sovereignty. That's why China did not attend arbitration in the first place. Uh, some, China is hardly the first country to do that. They have companies in the West. And unfortunately for China, China's not going to look very good because it's going to be perceived as thumbing its nose at international law. I would add one last thing, which is if this ruling had come out in favor of China, I suspect the government would be praising it and praising the body and all of its wisdom instead of criticizing it outright and just sort of more well, or less acting like an intransigent <laughs> well, child. Well, that's, well that's, how politi that's how politics works, okay? Uh, when Vietnam built the first airstrip in the Spratly Island in 1976, Washington wasn't um, too eager to jump to criticism of Vietnam. When the Philippines did it two years later um, by uh, you know, reclaim some islands in the Spratlys. Um, Washington did not jump to criticism of the Philippines. And also when the Philippines um, grounded the old naval vessel in the, uh, the second Thomas Shore or Yanai Washington again did not uh, jump to criticism of its ally Philippines. Uh, President Obama even explicitly admitted the containment strategies. In an interview with The Atlantic this April, he said, and I quote word for word, he said, if you look at how we've operated in the South China Sea, we have been able to mobilize most of Asia to isolate China in ways that have surprised China and frankly have very much served our interest in strengthening our alliances. So in using p politics, um, military deployment and international law, um, those issues, if those are not uh, getting up against China, I don't know what is. It really isn't about the U.S. though. This is really ultimately about what kind of country China wants to be perceived as what kind of global leader it wants to be perceived as in the global community. And the idea of unilaterally taking action and calling it a fait accompli, it, it's inconsistent with being a top leader at, at the table. To unilaterally go and create, and create a, a military, what is it, in, in essence a de facto military base, and claim it as your own, and then say, well, what are you objecting to? That doesn't really make any sense. The U.S. really need a new strategic posture. Uh, on China because uh, they use excuses such as protecting the sea lanes and trade. 
But if you look at those uh, facts, uh, China and the ASEAN countries traded quite all right. Uh, as the largest trading nation in the world, uh, five tr uh, China is, uh, five trillion dollars worth of trade going through South China Sea every year. Uh, and also, if the Asia pivot is about security issues, uh, what exactly are those security issues? On North Korea, I mean, North Korea hasn't been able to pull, pull off a real existential threat. Um, on terrorism, I mean, ISIS and Taliban are half a world away. Yeah. And if on non-proliferation, most okay. nuclear warheads are... All right, are gentlemen, Wang, I have, to, I have to jump in here. You raise very important questions that we can't answer right now. Many thanks to my guests in Washington and in New York. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules.